do not use your parents as your marriage counselors, ever, because long after you've forgotten, they'll still remember. Okay. And go, go, don't ever dishonor your spouse in front of your parents, ever. So when I was growing up, um, you know, we weren't in poverty, but we, we were, didn't have much. And I had uh, one pair of pants and two shirts growing up, hand-me-downs. And, you know, it was, it was embarrassing to me when, uh, when I would go to school. You know, every other day at school I had the same shirt on, and every day, every day I had the same pants on. I just didn't have any clothes. And I remember one time standing in front of my closet thinking to myself, you know, um, when I have money I'm going to buy clothes. I want, I want clothes. And uh, one day Karen said to me, Jimmy, you have too many clothes. I said, I do not, but we do need another closet. And when she said that to me, it bothered me, so you have too many clothes. And, and, and here's the way I think about it, could you have too many? Could, th- back then, could, could you have too many? And when she said that to me, I stood in front of my closet and I looked, and I could remember the time when I had two shirts and a pair of pants. I, I know a man that, very wealthy guy, and I was in his home one day, and his closet's as big as our bedroom, and he had, you know, 50 suits in this closet. And uh, I'm talking about two and $3,000 suits, and shirts, and all the clothes you can name. And we were standing in his closet, it was so funny, and he was kind of showing me through their home. And we were standing there in his closet, and I was just going, you know, I was like Jethro Bodine, you know, <laughs> and golly, and so, I, <laughs> and here's, here's the story he told. He said, when I was a little kid, we lived on a ranch, and we were very poor. And he said, my mother made us our clothing, and one day she made me a little orange jumpsuit that I wore to school. And she sa- he said, I wore this little orange jumpsuit to school, and he said, all the other kids made fun of me. And he said, I promised myself one day that if I ever had money, I'd buy clothes. And we were standing in his closet, and he said, I think I overdid it. <laughs> <laughs> he did. I said, I'm about your size, and uh, (laughs) you can go ahead and repent. (laughs) See, we, we typically, we typically have inner vows. Now, I'm, I'm saying this to say, you know you do, if you haven't dealt with these. As I'm speaking right now, most of us can identify a promise that we made to ourselves. Again, Jesus says, you took your life away from me. You're, you're, you're living to fulfill that rather than living to do what I want you to do. And, and in that area, you're unteachable and, and you're not, you know, you're not completely saint. You're just not. We go to extremes in those areas. How do you break inner vows? Number one, you ask the Holy Spirit to show them to you. Holy Spirit, is, is there an inner vow in my life? And some, sometimes we forget, because there's, because there's pain attached to it, sometimes we forget about it. But we can just ask the Holy Spirit, is there an inner vow in my life? Is there something I promised myself back when that I need to break? Number two is you repent to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I didn't know, I, honestly, because we don't know any better. I mean, you know, we don't know any better. God knows that. But we do now. And we realize the negative effect. Let me, let me give you an example of this. If you've been through bad relationships, let's just say you've been a bad, through a, a bad marriage in the past, and you say to yourself, no one's ever going to hurt me again, did you know the worst abusers in marriage are the people that have inner vows in their lives? The most abusive man I've ever counseled in marriage grew up under a very, very domineering mother. And he saw his mother emasculate his father every day, and he said to himself, I will never let a woman treat me like that. And let me just tell you something, he humiliated and dominated every woman in his life. Because he had made a vow, no woman's ever going to do that to me. So he went to the, like a drunk man on a horse, he goes to the other extreme, his father was docile, now he is a woman hater. And we repent and say, God, I repent. I repent of this inner vow and for taking that area of my life away from you. And here's the biggie. Here's number three. You got to forgive that person. Ex-husband, ex-wife, ex-business partner, friend, you know, someone who cheated on you, someone who hurt you, your parents, your, your brothers and sisters, your whatever, whoever it was. 
Lord, I forgive that person. Because again, you just, you're never going to be free from it until you forgive. And so, you forgive that individual. You bring that issue to Jesus, and you say, Lord, I repent of making that inner vow, and Lord, now I just pray in this area, teach me how. Teach me how to deal with money. Teach me how to treat people. I, I, I said one day, someone hurt me one time as a pastor, and I, I was, and it hurt really, really bad. And I was praying one morning, and I was praying to the Lord, and I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm not going to, no one's ever going to hurt me like that again. I said it to the Lord. And here's what the Lord said to me, Jimmy, I understand the importance of being wise in relationships, but if you're never going to let another person hurt you, you're going to close your heart, and I can't use you anymore. Let me just tell you something. If you're going to help somebody, you're going to get hurt sometime. And if we make the decision that says no one is ever going to hurt me again, we become mean, hard-hearted people. Some of the meanest people I know really were sweet people who just got hurt a lot and they became hard. You know, Absalom, the young man, David's son, who almost killed him, he, his sister was raped by his brother. And David did nothing about it. And Absalom took up her offense and killed the brother that raped her. And long before he became Absalom, the, the crazy young man that tried to kill his daddy, he was just a soft-hearted guy whose sister got hurt. If we're not careful, we go into extremes and we promise ourselves things And it changes our lives, and it changes our disposition in marriage. It changes the way you treat your spouse. It changes your value system. And more than anything else, it changes your relationship with the Lord. So we're going to pray in just a minute about iniquities and our vows. But that's the parents of our past. We have to deal with the parents of our past. Let's talk about the parents of our present. Here are four principles in dealing with parents and in-laws. Very important principles. The parents that we have now. Number one is the principle of honor. The Bible tells us to honor our mothers and fathers. Now, we don't obey them unless we're children at home. I don't have to obey my parents. Once I leave home, I'm I'm free from their authority. Now, if I'm taking money from my parents, if, if they're giving money, they may deserve more scrutiny. I mean, not to control me, but if they're giving me money, certainly they need to have conversations with me, maybe about, you know, if I'm taking money on an ongoing basis, but that still doesn't give them authority from my life. But you always honor your mother and father in the way that you talk about them and the way that you treat them as adults, I honor them. This is the first commandment with a promise, the Bible says, that we will live long and it will go well with us on the earth. God takes it very seriously how we treat our parents. Uh, in Mark 7, 11, Jesus said to the Pharisees that when it came to their parents and helping their parents out, that the Pharisees would say, well, anything that I would help you with is Corbin. In other words, it was given to God. Listen, we need to help our moms and dads. If your mother and father need help, you need to help your mother and father. Karen and I, my dad passed away, but we have three parents in their 80s. Let me tell you, we give each other a lot of grace to help our parents. Karen helps her parents a lot, and I help my mother a lot. And it's very important that we honor them, regardless of what they've done or or they're doing. Number two, not obey now, but to honor. Number two is the principle of separation. You have to separate enough from your parents to bond. There has to be some separation. You leave your mother and father to cleave into your wife. And that just means you have to have enough time together to bond, okay? So, let me talk about the, the characteristics of a problem in-law, okay? When you have an, in, an in-law relationship where they just won't give you enough time, is that, that you just don't have enough distance from them. And when I say distance, you may live uh, next door to them. That's not an issue at all. It's the emotional distance and them honoring your need for separation. A problem in-law, first of all, lacks bonding with their spouse. If, if they're married, they're not getting a bonding, the right bonding with their spouse. And mother-in-laws get a bad rap on this, but it could be a mother-in-law or a father-in-law. There are very few problem in-laws that have a fulfilling marriage. If they're getting their needs met there, they don't have to do that. The second characteristic of a problem in-law is they lack significance in other areas of their lives. They're, they're not serving in the community. They don't have a good network of friends. They don't, they, they're just, they're looking for significance. And then what happens is, because they're not bonded well with their spouse, and because they lack significance, they gain excessive identity through their children. And I'm saying this to all the mothers and fathers. When your children are growing up, love your children. They're precious. Love your children, but don't let them take this place of your spouse. 
because when they leave, you'll try to leave with them and emotionally follow them, and they won't want that. There'll come a point in time, and it, and it will ruin their marriages in the future. You work on your marriage, and when they leave, let me tell you, when our kids left, we cried for a few minutes, and then we partied. <laughs> and, you know, we had a great marriage, and we could run around the house in our underwear, and we were proud of it. And so, we loved our children. We raised our children the best that we knew how. They've had a successful life since then, and we missed them when they left. But I'll tell you, our, our marriage had an opportunity then to do things that we weren't able to before. Okay, they, and they become intrusive and even adversarial, a problem in law, intrusive, intrusive and adversarial for the attention of the child that they feel like that they've lost because of the relationship. And that is for a mother-in-law or a father-in-law of a man or a woman, they'll begin then to be adversarial. No one's good enough for my baby. Your, you know, your husband's doing this. Your wife is doing this. And so, here's how you handle a problem in-law. And that is you lovingly put parameters on your time with them. You lovingly do this. Everything you do, you do with love and respect but you have to do it. And that is, we love being with you guys. You don't tell them no. You just say, we love being with you guys. Hey, let's be, let's be with you guys this weekend. We'll, we'll eat lunch with you. We'll eat dinner with you. And they say, no, we want this and this and this. We just, I'm, we're so sorry. We love being with you, but we just can't do that because of our schedule. And so, you lovingly put parameters on them. Don't respond to manipulation or threats. And because sometimes a controlling in-law you know, they can manipulate and they can threaten and things like that. You just don't do that. You, you just, you can't. They'll control your life with that. Uh, don't allow them to control your life. Don't allow them to make your decisions for you. Is you have to make your own decisions. Now, you can get advice from them because they probably have a lot of wisdom, but it's the issue of control and encourage them to develop other interests. Uh, my mother is an example of this. When my dad died, you know, she uh, had a lot of loneliness in her life and things like that. We've done everything that we can. To, to, you know, to be with my mother. I make regular attempts to be with my mother, to talk to her on the telephone, and all those kinds of things. But my mother had to make some friends, and she did. My mother had to go kind of out of her comfort zone in her 80s to make friends, and she did, and it fulfills her. And listen to me, parents who do not have uh, friends their age, in-laws that don't have friends their age, are lonely even if they have close relationship with their children. See, it's not going to fix them, but it's going to break you. What I'm saying. If you go too far, if you give up the, the, you know, the separation of your marriage to try to fix the lives of your parents that are not socially engaged and don't have relationships with each other, it's not going to fix them, but it's going to break you. You need to encourage them, hey, mom and dad, you know, take up this hobby or go over here or do this or whatever. And I did that with my mother, and she, she's done phenomenal. She, she's done great. The number three principle is the principle of protection. You have to protect your spouse from your parents. It's your responsibility. You know, with, with my in-laws, and we have a wonderful relationship with my in-laws, I can't talk to them the same way Karen can. Karen can give them the short version. I can't do that. And Karen is very honoring of her mother and father, but Karen can just say to her mom, dad, uh -uh, don't talk about Jimmy like that. Don't do that. And she doesn't have to do that. My, my in-laws are great. But I'm saying, it's, I need Karen to protect me. If I have to, I can protect myself. But it means a lot to me if she's willing to do it. And I have to protect Karen for my parents. If my parents said something or did something, and I worked with my parents for seven years before I came into the ministry, on several occasions I had to just say to my mom and dad, because we did work together, this is where the line is right here. This is the line drawn right here. Okay. And very lovingly, very respectfully, this is the line here, and don't cross that line. And Karen always said, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for doing that. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility to protect your spouse from your parents. Now, if uh, it could be that your parents are so strong or there's some kind of a relationship there that you need the assistance of your spouse, that's fine. But if you stand back passively and don't deal with your parents while they're crossing a line and mistreating your spouse, that's wrong. Listen, do not use your parents as your marriage counselors ever, because long after you've forgotten, they'll still remember. Okay. And go, go, don't ever dishonor your spouse in front of your parents, ever, ever, because they'll pick up on that. If, if you need to vent, go to a very spiritual person, a pastor, a very godly friend who can handle it, and after you vented, vented they can say, okay, that's wrong, repent, you know, get your attitude right. And, and they can help you out. But with your mom and dad, they'll have a tendency to take up that offense. And so, I'm going to protect 
my spouse from my parents, and it's going to mean a, a lot to your spouse. And the fourth principle is the principle of friendship, is your parents, you know, I don't let my friends rearrange my furniture. You know, I mean, I just wouldn't allow that, and, uh, and they wouldn't try. But if, you're, if your parents cross those lines of controlling your life uh, with our kids, you know, if we let friends take care of our kids, you better honor our, our value system. And I wouldn't, you know, my parents, I, I love my mom and dad, but uh, when our kids were growing up, there was, we had to tell them, we don't let our kids watch those cartoons. You know, sometimes parents just don't know. It's been so long since they parented, they just don't know. But I, I told my parents one time, I said, those cartoons are bad. You know, back when I was growing up, it was, you know, Bugs Bunny and, you know, uh, Mickey Mouse and those kinds of things. And today, there's a lot of bad cartoons out there. So, sometimes they're not trying to do bad. They're just not, you know, current on what's right or wrong. But our parents are special friends. What would you let your friends do? You can basically take that to your parents, and that is the same boundaries exist. They can't control your life. They can't control your decision making. They can't do things with your children that violate your rules. If they're going to take care of the kids, if the kids are going to be with them, they need to be an extension of you, not a balance of you. Okay. And so, our parents are special friends. So, honor your mother and father. Honor your mother and father. You have to create enough separateness for you guys to be a family while still being close to them. And if there's problems, you need to defend each other. You need to protect each other, but be, but be friends with them and develop a good friendship and keep that friendship going. And I want to say one more time, if you invite their control, don't blame them if they do it. And if you let them use money or some other means to control you, don't blame them if they do it. You're the one who has to set the parameters, but do it very lovingly. Let me go back to the beginning of this message and talk about iniquities and vows as we close. And, and let me do this, I know for all of our host sites, I, I want you, if you would, just to bow your head there for just a minute. And I, I want to just go through this process of, of saying, I've never met a person, including Karen and me, who did not have iniquities in her vows. Now, you may have already dealt with this at some point, but these have a dramatic influence on our lives and our children's lives and our spouse. Okay, so how many of you, just bang your heads there, give, give everybody some privacy just by closing your eyes if you wouldn't mind. How many of you would say that just based on what you've heard that you have an iniquity, one or more iniquities in your life right now? Just want you to raise your hand, say, I've got one, I recognize it, okay, and then you put your hand right back down. So most people in this audience say they have uh, an iniquity, okay? How many of you would say, okay, you are ready to identify that, to take responsibility for your own behavior in that area, to forgive your mom and dad. I'm not quite finished now. Y'all are already raising your hand. That's good. <laughs> to forgive your mom and dad, okay, and to submit that area to Jesus, okay? If you are, just raise your hand. Jesus, we break these iniquities right now. We recognize that we have a bent in our lives that is wrong. And Lord, we forgive our moms and dads. We love them. We give them grace. But we repent of this behavior and this tendency in our lives. There's no excuse for it. And we surrender this to you. And in the name of Jesus, we break this off of our lives and off of our marriage and off of our children and grandchildren for generations to come. This will not go past us. And we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Just put your hands down. Keep your heads bowed if you would. I want to talk about inner vows. Jesus said they're evil, not because we're evil, but because it takes that area away from God. And the more inner vows that we have operating in our lives, the more our lives are being self-directed and God is not Lord in that particular area. Once again, keep your head bowed if you would, just for privacy's sake. How many of you would say, just based on what you've heard and maybe what the Lord is doing in your heart, you say, Jimmy, I've got inner vows in my life. Raise your hand if you would. Just raise your hand. Keep your hand up there for just a second so I can look around. Okay, put your hands down. I'd say 70% of, of this uh, group here just raise their hand. That might be representative of all the, the groups there where people are in the other, other campuses. So, just keep your head bowed there for just a minute. Jesus said this is, this is a, a bad thing. W we were trying to comfort ourselves. I know when you made that vow, you weren't trying to be a bad person. You were trying to comfort yourself. I was too when I made my inner vows. But it took that area away from Jesus. And again, 
we become irrational. We, we go to extremes, and we become unteachable. When someone approaches us in that area, we become very defensive. Okay. Jesus, we forgive whoever hurt us. Whatever circumstances led to us making that promise, we forgive everyone involved, Lord, because they had their own issues that only you know about. And Lord, we, we repent of saying that. And we did not know at the time it was the wrong thing to do. But we repent for taking this area away from you. We bring this area back to you. And we say, Jesus, we make you the Lord of our relationships. We make you the Lord of our money. We make you the Lord of our heart and our future. We make you the Lord God of every area of our lives. And we submit this area to you. And we break the power of this inner vow over us and our marriage and our children and grandchildren and generations to come. In Jesus' name, if that's your prayer, I just want you to raise your hand and say, that's my prayer this morning. Lord, we break these inner vows off of our lives. And Lord, I just, I just say a special prayer for our moms and dads right now. Lord, we thank you for our moms and dads. They probably went through things that we don't even understand. But we bless them. We pray for our families to be unified. We pray for all of our families to be saved. Our brothers and sisters, our aunts and uncles, our moms and dads, our in-laws, we pray for all of them to be saved. And we pray that we could be a Joseph to our families, that we could go before them into the promised land and bring them all in behind us, Lord, that we would be a loving and righteous influence upon them. And I pray this morning, God, just for our marriages, Lord, let our marriages be healed from any of the influences, the negative influences of our past and our iniquities and inner vows. And let us begin again with a new future in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said.